Christopher. Okay. Um, we're going to call to order the April 18th meeting of the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee. Let's see. First thing is, uh, I guess we should do kind of a roll call first and just for the record. So, Bob Ravazio. We'll start next. Kirby Bartlett. Tony Garza. Cheryl Ancinati. Tom Nofsiger. Tom Nofsiger. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, let's do the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. And again, my apologies for the confusion this evening, but um, we're going to have the meeting and hopefully everything will be okay. So we're going to start with open time for the public regarding non-agenda items this is to talk about items that are not on the agenda if you can please give your name and limit your comments to three minutes that would be appreciated thank you Is this working? There it goes. Yes, there all right. Go. Cindy Winter, Luxburg. I'm going to tell everybody about what Bill Whitney said about that overcrossing between the two shopping centers, and I have something more to add to it. Briefly, and I want to be brief here, I was talking with him, and he said, out of the blue, has anybody said anything more about those two shopping centers in Corte Madera? there was going to be a bridge put there. And I think that would be such a wonderful idea. And I said, oh, Bill, I think so too. <laughs> and I said, um, I thought it would bring a lot more business to the shopping centers because the whole would be greater than the sum of its parts. And then he said it would be easy to get the span across 101. Caltrans would pay for it. But then there's the question of the ramps because the span would be 20 feet over the freeway, and then the ADA ramps have to be at roughly 5%. There's strict requirements, and that means 400 feet of ramps on each side. I know this from GSIP. And where would those ramps end up? So I was looking at TAM's <coughs> measure AA. Um, it's their 2018 final expenditure plan. This seems to be the Bible. You extrapolate from there. And it says, category two, Measure AA promotes innovative transportation investments. That's the bridge between the shopping centers with a priority to matching public and private funds. So here's my question. Is matching literal? Does it have to be 50-50? Or could it be 37, 30-70? And what would the shopping center, what would each be willing to do to contribute to the ramps? Because those ramps could be very expensive. Peter knows it could be a couple <coughs> million dollars each one, maybe more with seismic resistance. I don't know. And those ramps would take some parking spaces. And those parking spaces have a commercial value, especially if you imagine them out over the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, however they're, they, long they are there, and with inflation adjustments upwards. So how can those parking spaces be collateralized? That's what I would like to know from a numbers guru. I'm looking at Kirby because I think he knows about we're, numbers. So just to remind you, we are not allowed to address items at public oh. time because it's not on the agenda. We're only allowed to talk about items on the agenda. So if this is not on the agenda, I don't think. It's not on the agenda. You're making a public comment. and I'm not supposed to talk with Kirby. 
<laughs> we're, not, we're not allowed to talk about it if it's not on the agenda. I just went through this Tuesday night at length, so thank you. Okay, I will cease and desist, but I think there's an opportunity there because Bill is very much in Corte Madera's corner here, and so we'll keep our fingers crossed and use our imaginations. Thank you, Cindy. If you want to line up behind the microphone, that'd be great. Okay. We can keep things moving. Jim Robinson, uh, 25 Ash Avenue, Court of Madeira. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank uh, Mayor Avazio and Peter Brown for our new uh, ADA-approved crosswalk and handicap ramps in front of Neil Cummings School. Uh, this is, as Bob knows, painfully knows my many trips to this <laughs> meeting and council meetings, and we now have one. I, I just would make one editorial comment to whoever's on the uh, Safe Route to School Committee on the council that uh, they not take eight years to get an approved ADA handicap uh, crosswalk in front of what, of what that t at that time was the only elementary school serving Larkspur and Corte Madera. But thanks for to Peter. We appreciate uh, getting that done. Secondly, um, I think it was Cheryl, committee member Cheryl, that mentioned to me almost a year ago about concerns about parking Riviera Circle in the city of Larkspur. And I had some concerns about that because I know from prior experience, whenever you address uh, and regulate parking in one area, it pops up somewhere else. So I went to the uh, Larkspur City Council meeting and uh, expressed my concern. This was back in the fall and mentioned to them that we'd already noticed some parking on Apache and Birch and Lakeside. Uh, this was back in the fall of 2018. Uh, since then, the city of Larkspur has adopted some regulations, and I understand from a meeting that Peter and I and the police chief and the city manager, town manager, attended with the principal mm -hmm. on Monday of this past week. Uh, that uh, they are now beginning enforcement of that, and it's a contributing factor to what we have now is about 35 to 40 cars parked on Apache, Lakeside, and Birch. And also, which is interesting because uh, this extension of Birch is actually in the city of Larkspur, is actually a private street. And I was at, uh, I walk that regularly, so I, was, I had an opportunity to talk to a couple of people that live on that extension of Birch, it's private street in the city of Larkspur. And they express their grief about the situation. And they obviously have a situation, as they do on Apache, where Monday through Friday, uh, after school hours, even on Saturday, Sunday, you won't see a single park, car parked in that area. Now, why do I bring this to the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee? Because that's an area where we have students walking. We also have uh, students at uh, Hall Middle and Neil Cummings that uh, use the bike path. And we are concerned in Madeira Gardens about the increased volume of traffic and as I mentioned at my meeting I confess that I had two three teenage sons so I know how people drive at that age on occasion uh, and I am concerned about that and there are other residents that can speak for themselves that also have mentioned concerns so I'm hopeful that uh, if there is some solution that doesn't involve an increase uh, in our volume in traffic uh, that uh, it'll get some uh, play from the bicycle pedestrian advisory committee and support from you all as well if the council comes up to a solution to that. There are some other extenuating issues relative to the new rules that Larkspur, or excuse me, that the uh, Redwood High School uh, has relative to students with uh, parking passes because we now have a situation where there's more kids with more cars and fewer parking spaces. And one of the things that we noted at the meeting that there seems to be an abundance of vacant parking spaces in the east parking lot, and I've noted that, uh, I've counted them four or five times in the last year. And I think that there are some other solutions. There's a, a school that's uh, off campus that's near the Redwood High School also has a lot of available parking available. So there may be some solutions on campus that uh, might resolve the issue for Riviera Circle and also for the residents uh, in Corte Madera and maybe uh, reduce that level of tra traffic in Madera Gardens, uh, particularly during the school hours we have, as I mentioned, the pedestrians and bicyclists uh, at Larkspur, at, uh, uh, Larkspur at, at Hall Middle School and in Corte Madera at uh, Neil Cummings School. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Jim. Anybody else? Good evening, my name is Anita Bach and I'm here representing the Christmas Tree Hill Neighborhood Response Group. Um, I just wanted to uh, raise another issue which we raised last year and town staff um, summarily dismissed our concerns about it, but we would like to bring it up again and ask you for your consideration. Um, as you know, Christmas Tree Hill attracts a tremendous number of pedestrians and bicyclists on the weekends. So we have a large number of, in addition to residents up there, a large number of visitors. 
And none of our uh, bicycles, paths, and lanes, which you'll be discussing later, are signed for evacuation routes. Um, the reason town staff gave us last time for uh, not considering or discussing it was that they did, felt that they did not want to um, send people into the path of a wildfire. And we are not proposing something that's directional. It says you have to go down here, but there is a universal, as you probably all know, uh, emergency evacuation route sign, which is used worldwide. Uh, and we just think that for the protection of both our uh, huge number of visitors every weekend and on holidays and stuff, and for our residents that having a sign at uh, one of the pathways, uh, be they steps or lanes, um, would go a long way uh, to protecting our residents and to protecting the visitors to Christmas Tree Hill. We are particularly concerned about this issue, of course, because of wildfire. Uh, and many people who live on the hill don't know where they are, uh, not to mention the people who are visiting every weekend who have no clue where to go if, they, if their um, you know, bicycle path is blocked on one of the roads. So we would just ask you uh, for your consideration of the issue at some point in time and recommendation possibly to the town to do this. These signs are inexpensive. They cost $50. Uh, we probably need no more than 20 on the hill, so we're not talking about a huge number, uh, you know, a huge expenditure. So thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? Jean Severinghouse, Green Bay Boardwalk in Corte Madera's sphere of influence. Um, so you can't talk about it, but can I talk about one of the subjects that came up? You have three minutes. You're I have three minutes. Great. About anything so Actually, I'm, on minutes safe, I'm on the safe. I'm on the safe routes to school, uh, Larkspur Corte Madera Green Bay Committee, and in fact, this issue has come up, and we've been working in the schools, been actually doing a fantastic job at trying to narrow down their issues with a lot of seniors when juniors wanting to park and drive. And first of all, they made every student who wanted a parking permit, they had to submit a Google Map showing that they lived more than a 20-minute walk away before they could even be eligible to park a car on campus, which was great. Um, Larkspur is doing a bang-up job, although it's complicated in Riviera Circle. And I'm wondering if Corte Madera, since it sounds like part of that area is Corte Madera and part of it's Larkspur, from what I'm hearing you say, maybe the, the BPAC could say we would support a ban, a, a multi-town ban on all parking f um, during the school hours um, on within a half a mile of the, I don't know, is it called Apache, the one that, that address goes over the, over the pathway? There, there needs to be something to discourage the kids from driving. Um, there's half the number of kids there now is when I went to Redwood. I rode a bike because my dad said, here's your bike, go, from Ross. It was an easy ride, 16 minutes. So it's not a hard thing for kids to do for the most part. The kids in Tiburon can get their permits. So I would encourage the BPAC to think about that and maybe have a dialogue about, about supporting safe routes to school. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I met with the town attorney about this the other night, and I am allowed to refer this to the town manager who is not here, but I know what he's doing on this, so I can talk about it. Um, we, this came up at the council meeting Tuesday night, and Todd Cusimano is extremely involved in working with the school and members of the community in um, Madera Gardens trying to solve this issue right now. I've been getting emails almost every day from him on it. He's, it's active. He's on it, and we're going to come up with a solution uh, working with Larkspur in the school. So I'm allowed to say that according to our, our, our attorney. Okay. Thank you, even though it's not on the agenda, because it's going to be one of my reports. Um, anybody else? Okay. Hearing none, we will move on to committee member reports. Uh, you heard, actually, I guess, half of mine. Uh, the other one is just that the council Tuesday night um, approved um, the initial expenditures on the uh, whole improvements around Tanridge Apartments, which are Warren and Nellon, and fixing that bike path, eventually putting the cycle path in, and you know, fixing that intersection. But we approved all the initial funding for that and some expenditures on that environmental. So all that has started, and that's going to be rolling. And I know we first started working on that, I think, a couple of years ago, and I think it was with Nisha, actually. <laughs> did the initial yes. <laughs> application on that. We got an ATP grant to fund that whole project. So we're making progress. Anybody else? Any reports? Yes. Um, I was contacted by Peggy Clark of uh, Wayne County Bicycle Coalition about uh, Bike to Work Day, which will be May 9th. 
and um, uh, REI is going to take charge of the um, Energizer station at the end of the uh, Sander Marker Trail at Warnham and Camo Vista. And they'll do um, the setup, they'll do packing the you know, swag bags and all that. So we don't have any responsibilities. We can just show up okay. and um, let people know about the VPAC. So okay. just invite everyone to do that. Um, can I m make a comment about something else? Not if it's else? not on the agenda. Okay. Oh, Sorry. Yeah, that's all. Sorry. We've had I've had multiple meetings with about that topic, so all right. <laughs> it's well, very I, fresh. Can I can I just say something uh, um, about a the Redwood report? Path, the Redwood Path that we also had uh, Go ahead. discussed years ago, um, and I just want to know the the tree damage that we all know about is getting worse on that path. And the other day I was, I put my eyeglass case against this bump and it was about the same height and it's, it will knock someone over if they're not paying attention. Okay. So I just want to let Peter know. Thank you. Really noted. Okay, yes. Kirby. What are the limitations on the committee member reports that we can talk about? Uh, ideally, what I would like it to be is if you are in something involving your capacity as a BPAC member and you are in a meeting and you're going to report back on that, that is ideally what this time is for. We do the same thing with town council reports and it's about, you know, town council assignments. It's usually not for stuff you do on a personal level outside of your responsibility. So if I was out running a trail and noticed a hazard out there pointing you that out? What I would recommend you do if you have issues like that, as a BPAC member, contact staff. But just, you know, there's no need to do it in a meeting. Just okay. email Peter, call Peter, right? Is that reasonable? And say, here's, you know, I found this problem and would you please look into it? Okay. And, you know, the same thing with questions about a meeting, you know, after an agenda comes out, you know, contact staff and, you know, talk to them about it beforehand and they can address it for you. And Peter is our li staff liaison, or? Typically it's Jared, um, but he's not here today. So today call Peter, but typically call Jared. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you can call me anytime. Yeah, Peter's great. He's extremely responsive, but that's typically how we handle that stuff. Then I have no committee member report. Okay, thank you. No report. No report. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Then we'll move on to the next. First agenda item, project updates and discussion. Um, Sanford Casabuena intersection improvement out to bid. Yeah. Peter. Thank you, Chair Ravazia, members of the BPAC and members of the public. I apologize uh, for my tardiness today. Uh, I respect your time, and, and today wasn't a good day uh, to get here at 6 o'clock, but I'm glad we're firing forward. Um, what we would like uh, for the BPAC committee to know is that we've had a lot of discussion about this particular intersection improvement uh, since we last spoke with you about it. We finished the final design. We had a few community meetings. Uh, we did a trial closure that I think many of you are aware of, where for, I think, about three days, we closed down the northbound Sanford movement. That's the first car you see in that photo. Um, and we just gave it a, a whirl, and it turned, it turned out that what we expected, which was improved circulation, reduced confusion at the intersection, uh, occurred. Uh, what we didn't have during the trial closure was all the bicycle and pedestrian improvements that are part of that. Um, improved crossings at Casa Buena at the bus stop, uh, a new crossing here along the base of uh, Meadow Suite, uh, and really a reconfiguration, and, and I, I consider a safety movement for all four primary modes here, transit users, people walking, biking, or driving. Um, so here's just kind of existing existing conditions. Um, as you know, it can be a confusing intersection for folks when they meet up there. And just to kind of remind everyone, since when I say this is out to bid, when we get responsible bids uh, that we expect to happen here in the next couple of weeks, we'll come to council and we'll uh, recommend that it be awarded. And uh, the BPAC committee and the public will see construction this summer. So this is probably the first uh, uh, season of construction where you'll see things like reduced crossing distance and enhanced bulb outs here at this crosswalk, two new crosswalks across Sanford, um, and, one, and, and one across Meadow Suite that doesn't exist. Uh, there's a bike slip lane, that's this thing. So it's a northbound bike movement where bikes are allowed and, and people walking are allowed, but this vehicular movement is no longer allowed. 
Um, and we're also looking at some intersection improvements here for pedestrians. I know people have asked about uh, lead pad intervals and uh, some improvements uh, there. Um, but yeah, that's it for the project update on that. Um, happy to take any questions on the construction season or any questions from the. Um, yeah. uh, may I also? I guess that? we can do public comment on these. Sure, so. sure. Yeah. Go ahead. If you can come up to the microphone, I need you to come to the microphone, okay, please. And, and if you don't mind giving your name. And if you could turn the microphone back on, I think I turned it off. Um, could you go back to the first photograph, please? This is not related to the construction, but um, it adds to the congestion in that area. Um, when the town um, made new parking spaces, when you just go around this corner over here, are you familiar with the main, the main street? Right here. They added parking spaces along there. They, there used to be um, no parking, um, you know, for a um, probably about 100 yards towards the intersection. And that lane was used for right-hand turns, people going to the bank and so on, and bicyclists, of course, would congregate there as they waited to cross over. But when they recently redid the parking, they brought the parking right to the intersection. So there's a car right there. So cars who want to turn right um, have no lane to be in, and, and bicyclists are now forced to stand, you know, in between two vehicles as they try to get across the intersection. So, you know, I hope that at some point they'll reconsider at least taking two of their parking spaces away. I think that would ease um, the congestion on that corner tremendously, especially on the weekend when there were so many bicyclists, and it's a safer, I think, proposition. Thank you. Thank you. Jim, you want to comment on this? Yeah, Jim Robinson, Town of Corte Madeira. I didn't, wasn't able to interpret that diagram as quickly as put up and taken down, but I just had one question. If I could go to the, <coughs> go back to the picture first. Um, I used to walk to the library regularly. And I don't do that anymore because when you go to this place here and you're waiting across the street of Town of Pius, it's not the traffic on East Westbound and Town of Pius concerned about it. It's the people making this quick right turn there and they're looking at the signal, not looking at the people stepping out in the street. And I almost didn't make it past 65 a couple of times as a result of that. <laughs> so I'm just curious how that will be designed once these improvements are completed. Because people just have a tendency to look up at the light. They're not looking at you at that corner to step out at the intersection there. And that was always my concern and fear there. Yeah. Um, Chair Vazio, if I could answer that. Um, so the, the solution to that issue is, is what I mentioned when I used the term lead ped interval. So that just means the pedestrian gets the green before the vehicles do. Um, and what that tends to do is you hold the uh, right turn or the through movement red and for five or eight seconds, you get a green walk symbol and you, you, you go ahead and move across the intersection and then um, they're much more visible uh, and, and it's kind of a safety improvement. The only thing is this is one of our busiest intersections uh, in town and so anytime we change allocation of time to any given movement, it can cause other delay, but that's the solution we're pondering now for the issue that was raised. Thank you. Any other public comment? Hearing none, I'll bring it back to the council for comments. Where well, it's the question period, right? Or that was the question period, but you can ask. You can still ask a question if you want. It's back to the BPAC now, so go ahead. Yeah, I thought, okay. Um, I'm trying to period. stick with the protocol. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. I'm trying um, to keep us on it. Yeah. So if you were coming from the 76 gas station crossing and then wanted to go to the library, um, where would you cross the street? I mean, I'm trying to think of... Not that somebody from the 76 gas station and wants to go to the library, but um, maybe you do. Okay. Um, so ha do you have to go all the way east there to cross and then come back over? I'm just, that's, if you could walk me through that. Because it seems like, um, oh, that's hey, it's right over here. Somebody's coming here, and then so they have to come here and then go back there. Is that, is that really what the path? I, uh, 
<laughs> Board member Bartlett, I wouldn't go that way. I would come, I would cross here, <laughs> I would walk way. just like this and either walk straight across into the entrance or I would go this way and come in. You could do that route if you're really trying to get your steps and you're looking at your watch. <laughs> um, but I don't, um, I've had this question actually came up at, at council. Um, I know there's some concern. It sounds like the main concern, the main question not being asked, being implied is why are you taking this uh, crosswalk away? Um, so this required a lot of thought and a lot of field observation. Um, in the mornings, uh, the, the biggest destination here, aside from Pete's Coffee, is this bus stop. And everybody is crossing the road right here, either from Pete's or even when they walk along through the bank uh, parking lot or they stole through this intersection. I, I, we saw very few people using this and many people using this. Um, another issue with the safety uh, of this particular intersection, when there are cars coming off of TAM and turning this way, they have their eyes on this car coming forward. Um, they're not sure if anyone's coming out of these driveways. Th it's not a good sight line. The nice thing about moving the sidewalk or the crosswalk back to here is everybody lines up and is squared in both directions with high visibility to the pedestrians. Um, so that's the basic rationale uh, for this particular um, change. And all in all, uh, if you do, you know, want to get a Snickers bar and hit the library, um, then, you know, we feel like this route is uh, maybe uh, additional 10 to 15 seconds of walking. So worth the uh, trade-off in safety and line of sight for us. Thank you. I think I had a deja vu moment in you explaining that before. Um, you know, it's back to the council now. Okay. Sorry. So I go through Pete's. <laughs> You're going to do it anyway? Okay. Just ignore me? That's fine. Okay. Go ahead. If you really need to, Jean, please. But I'm really trying to stick to protocol because okay. we started 45 so, minutes late. It's um, can you put a crosswalk from the library to Pete's? Thank you. You want to answer that, or uh, we don't. We don't have anything like that planned. Okay. No. Thank you. Uh, comments from the council. Just a question. Do you need a warrant for a crosswalk? Yeah, you need. You need warrant. You need sight lines. You need intersection. There's a lot of things where if we don't have all the data backing it up, then uh, we get exposed to liability. Um, so, so yeah, it's. Another thing is, you know. Pedestrians, a lot of times in this case, are going to do what they what they do, regardless of where we paint the road. So, uh, one thing uh, comment I had was, you know, we actually did this for three days. Correct. Yeah, and Peter spent a lot of time meeting with the neighborhood group, who was very concerned about it. But we did it for three days, and I was fully expecting my email account to go through the roof, which usually happens with stuff like this, and it did not. It was surprisingly you know, well accepted <coughs> and quiet and worked, yeah. I think, much better than a lot of people had feared that it would. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for Which that. Which helped the council approve it moving forward. So yeah. I think it's a good improvement. Anything else from the council? I think if I could just add one yeah. thing. I, I had a question about that circuitous route to the library. Perhaps some signage mm -hmm. might help. I, I have I have a couple of a few children, and we do the go to the library. So there is back and forth to the mall, and one might go. I'm going to go to the Barnes and Noble instead of the library, mm -hmm. <laughs> or such. But perhaps some signage or something to help ease that. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, then let's move on to Central Marin Gap Closure Project Update, which I've referred to in my report. Uh, thank you, Chair Ravazio. So uh, this actually uh, is very timely in the sense that uh, Chair Ravazio got to see it twice in the same week. Um, <laughs> so uh, this went to council, and the question before council is, uh, you know, the project approval and environmental design phase, is it ready to move forward? Uh, the council decided on Tuesday night that it was. Uh, and so I just want to remind BPAC uh, where we are with this project. Uh, since, um, you know, we, we are uh, completing the environmental. So MND is the California Environmental Quality Act term for mitigated and negative declaration. So it just means that the overall environmental impacts to this proposed project um, are less than significant with a couple of mitigation measures. Uh, and so just to kind of recap everybody, uh, the Central Marin Gap Closure Project is one that staff prior to uh, my arrival at least applied for an active transportation grant to put in 
uh, enhanced pedestrian crossings across Pfeiffer and a two-way cycle track or a class four facility along Mellon, and then improve uh, the pedestrian and bicycle environment along Warnham as well. Um, we wanted to start with this slide uh, because there's a lot of other things going on, right? There's the Sander Marker Trail, there's the path that um, is 95% designed, the Redwood Highway Rehabilitation Path, where the roots are causing a lot of damage. So that is slated to go for construction following summer. Um, and then there's also this alignment of the North-South Greenway. Uh, this idea of a bicycle bridge across the old railroad trestle was abandoned. And so now the um, Caltrans and, and Transportation Authority Marin are widening this four foot wide pathway to make it to be about 10 or 12 feet wide. Um, to really enhance. And then the city of Larkspur is looking at some bicycle and pedestrian safety improvements along Redwood. So this is a corridor that is fairly difficult to travel in if you're in an active transportation mode. And I believe that all of these uh, improvements that are in various phases of development are good uh, for the traveling public here. Uh, and just to remind you of some of the features, uh, Again, this project's in design. Uh, we just cleared the environmental. We, we have another year to really finish the engineering plans for this, uh, and we don't have construction funds. But what we do have is a project that, broken out by each of these five areas, which I'll go over quickly, um, are, are phasable, right? So five kind of points to this uh, uh, crosswalk here at Pfeiffer. That needs improvement, right? Um, same thing with the two-way cycle track here. And then you can kind of see a vision of um, Warren and Nellen. Uh, there's, we have some issues with vehicular circulation on Tamil Vista, and we're pondering opening up Pfeiffer. And if we do, we would need a traffic signal or a roundabout here to, to really uh, help facilitate um, those movements, and that's kind of a, a drawing of what that mini roundabout would look like. Um, zooming in here on the Warnham pathway, so everyone's oriented. This is the Sandra Marker Trail. Uh, here's kind of uh, some of the ideas for improving the crosswalks and really this connection across the Sandra Marker Trail. Uh, this particular uh, option shows moving the curb line towards the roadway and kind of eating up the width of the roadway. Uh, to provide more width and space for uh, kind of improving this pathway, uh, which of course goes over to the Redwood Highway path. Um, and you kind of look at how some of these nice pedestrian crossings are built into um, the, the roundabout feature there. Kind of looking through 101 here and continuing this connection, we, we, I definitely have heard a lot at BPAC meetings and elsewhere that this crossing is important and needs improvement. Uh, and so uh, this is also kind of a schematic look at how we might widen this Warnham path. Um, the Pfeiffer Avenue Ped Crossing, the idea here, uh, first of all, this is very difficult to deal with because these are Caltrans ramps on and off ramps. And so everyone in this direction, the southbound 101 direction, is accelerating to get on the freeway. Everyone who makes this corner um, is, you know, all of a sudden has a new sight line here. So the idea with this ped crossing is, first of all, you're crossing half the distance when it's clear. You don't have to run across the whole road. Uh, and then you would turn and face the oncoming traffic, uh, in this case, up Pfeiffer, uh, and then cross again. So obviously there's a uh, the bus stop is still out here. Uh, there's a, another ped bridge over here. And so this is an important uh, improvement. Here's a look at how that opening um, may turn out. Uh, it'll be a two-way travel way uh, on, on Nellen, and you can come up, to, if you're heading in this direction, you would stop and turn around. This, this particular part would be one way only. Um, so just kind of some of the schematic looks. Uh, we saw another shot of the roundabout potential there. Uh, and then this kind of speaks to the need for that roundabout or traffic signal here. Um, and that is this queue is really long. So the only way to get through, this is the longest left turn lane uh, in, in Port of Madera and maybe in Marin County uh, for <coughs> this one single lane. So this movement is big. Uh, when we model this using traffic modeling by opening up this, cars that are coming uh, off of uh, Doherty and, 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 and Lucky, uh, they will basically pick the green light. If they're going to here, right, or they're coming over to Redwood Highway, if it's green, this is probably going to be the best option to, to make your route. And uh, if it's red and you're waiting for this right turn, then this will be the preferred route. So it modeled really well. Uh, and this is kind of goes to that philosophy that we've had, or at least that I've had since I've got here, is, is really about multimodal, right, options. So I, I don't think we just have to do, in this particular case, bicycle and pedestrian improvements. We can look for vehicular improvements and, and congestion relief at the same time. Um, as we're building in those safety options. Um, so 
Again, this went to council. Uh, we got project approval for these concepts. We cleared the environmental phase. Uh, we filed a notice of completion. It's, I think it has 28 more days of protest uh, period, if anyone thinks that we didn't do a good job assessing all the environmental impacts. And then we can really move into detailed design over the next year. Um, so I think that's it for that project summary. Thank you. Any questions for Peter from the council? Yeah. Um, Peter, in pushing out the curb along Warnham, going pushing it a little bit north, um, does that eliminate the shoulder right now? There's a stripe, and cyclists can ride. In, those that don't want to be on the path can ride on the in that shoulder area parallel to cars. There's enough room there. Mm -hmm. Is that's going to eliminate that? Yeah. So. Um, you know, right now there isn't really bike class, what we would call class two bike lanes. They're basically shoulders or a couple of feet wide. There's not a lot of room there. Uh, that is actually a question that, that we wrestled with, and that's why we're not in final design. This is just a preliminary concept. Um, what you do when you push the curb out is you really enhance this from eight feet wide to you can make it 10 to 12 feet wide uh, and make it attractive for all users. Um, fast uh, recreational weekend warriors may still choose to take the lane. I mean, we, they, they can take the lane and ride through here just about as fast as most cars can, but we do kind of lose that, that shoulder under this scenario. Um, so it's the trade-off to really try to enhance what honestly has a lot more volume. So for every one or two cyclists that are willing to take the lane and are moving fast through there, we have 10 to 15 uh, users of all types walking and biking on the Warnham path. So we kind of want to put our preference toward the volume there. Any other questions from the council? Okay. Any public comment? Cindy Winter. I've had a number of questions about the roundabout. I don't know anything about roundabouts. I have no objection to a roundabout, but it does seem to me that when there's the next bike ped public outreach meeting that there needs to be more definition of whether that roundabout will squeeze out cyclists when a big vehicle is going around it. I have no idea, but there's a mystification there and I think it should be addressed. Not necessarily right now, whatever. Okay, thank you. Anybody else from the public wish to speak or have questions about this? Okay, then I will bring it back to the council. Again, we're not taking action on this, but any comments or anything? I'll make a comment. Um, it's related to roundabouts. Um, there's one in the Civic Center, and I've seen it in action. I've walked and driven through it, and it's, I've been pretty impressed about the flow of pedestrians and cars that go through that roundabout. Yeah, we're already kind of prepared on the council for, you know, Peter's a fan of roundabouts, and the first one is going to be hugely controversial. It doesn't matter where it is, it's going to be controversial, but I, I completely agree with you because I've been through enough of them to realize that once you get over the initial phase of what do I do, what do I do, it, it makes everything work better. <laughs> so I think it will be an improvement. So. Yeah, Chair Vazio, I might just, I, I always like uh, educating, and I thought it was a good question from Cindy Winter, and I think the, uh, the BPAC is, is maybe interested. So the nice thing about roundabouts is uh, as, as cyclists, if we say, let's say there's two users, a slow and, and, a, and a faster user, um, people who are less comfortable uh, in roundabouts, they tend to act like pedestrians. So if you're coming down Nellon and you're in this uh, cycle track, uh, you're free to get on the sidewalk, come over here when it's clear, you know, you can walk your bike, walk, ride slowly and pick up this path. Um, other more uh, comfortable users and, and eventually many more users as they become more familiar with roundabouts, uh, when they ride their bikes, they choose the lane. And, and the reason why that's more uh, comfortable with a roundabout than a signalized intersection is everybody's required to go to the same speed. So. Um, while cars don't wait typically very long for roundabouts, they do move, move through them slowly, and it's at a speed that 
typically as a cyclist, you could queue up behind a, a car and fit right in. And when you have a, an opportunity, you can enter. Um, so, uh, but we, I think that's a good suggestion. Uh, I am, I've done a lot of work. I've implemented these in other parts of the state and I've found really good improvements for safety and circulation. And so I'm going to try to do the same here in Corte Madera, but I do agree. We're going to have to have some outreach. We're going to have to talk to the public about it. And ultimately, you know, it's going to come down to whether the council is willing to try it and see how it goes. Um, so thank you. Okay. Uh, C discuss, give cyclists three feet signage location. Uh, okay, um, this was all the CEQA parts. Okay, so um, this uh, item, uh, item C, thank you, Chair Ravazio, uh, came at the request of some of the uh, BPAC members at the last meeting. So uh, occasionally we take good notes. And even if we don't show up on time, we do bring uh, back items that you've requested um, that we bring. And this was one of them. So uh, I wasn't a part of the December 15th, 2016 uh, discussion. Uh, but we looked at uh, some notes from uh, from Nisha Patel, uh, and we have so we have these notes. So you don't really need to read them all now, but we do. You know, Paradise uh, Harbor in both directions, bottom of Corte Madera Avenue. So there's some suggestions that we've been given by BPAC prior uh, that basically say, hey, this is something that is important uh, to you know use this signage, make it better known to the public. I personally. Uh, ride my bike at least several times a week and find that uh, I don't always get three feet. So um, I don't also don't know if where this signage is prevalent does behavior change. I don't know the answer to that, but um, uh, I'm happy to uh, have anyone from the BPAC help uh, me and the, and the public understand your desires on this. And I'm also happy to um, take down the suggestions for signage locations and get your input on if this is something you want staff to push forward. Okay, so any questions from the council? Yes. Yeah. Are there, what are the rules about signs? Um, as I drive down the street, a lot of the signs relate to st information that is right there. There's a crosswalk here, right? The speed limit changed. Are there any rules about signs that don't relate to what is, you know, physically present right there? Can we just put a sign for every rule? Uh, the answer to your question, uh, Kirby, is that there are many rules for all of this stuff, and I would hate for you to learn them all. Um, but the, the MUTCD, uh, the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, is uh, both a federal document and, and Caltrans has its own version, which is slightly different. Uh, and so that is the governing uh, uh, document that we have to follow when we put up signage, or what we call traffic control devices. A sign is one of those. Uh, so yeah, we can't just put them everywhere. Uh, we have to consider safety, sight distance, applicability, um, and value, uh, and then we have to do that with engineering judgment. So uh, those are some of the. I don't. Those are. The, I don't want to get into all the details of what we have to look for. But um, what I would do is take this existing list, take any modifications from any of you, any new suggestions. Uh, as well as do the five of you sitting here today want to see some of these in the ground in the next year or two? Um, and then we could, you know, uh, see if we can make a work item out of that. So when it's our turn to come back, you want to know if we think we should put these up? It'd be helpful for okay. us. Yeah. Okay. Any other There's questions? Question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Staff? Okay. Uh, public comments, questions? Again, I'm sorry, you gotta, you're actually being recorded and will be on TV. I have a quick clarification question. You know, one of the biggest bicycle issues, I think, here along Corte Madeira Avenue on the weekend is bicyclists riding two next to each other, side by side, talking, chatting. Um, how does this rule apply to that? I mean, do they have to ride in single file? And wouldn't, would it be very helpful to have another sign that said, you know, encouraged cyclists to ride single file. I mean, if you have to give three feet to two cyclists who are doing this, which I see constantly on the weekend, um, you know, I think that would really be difficult for traffic to uh, to do that. So just wondered what, what how the two relate. Thank you. Thank you. We'll just answer all the questions at okay. once at the end, okay. if that's OK. Yeah, go ahead, Jim. Still Jim Robinson. Uh, I would recommend that uh, the BPAC consider whatever is prudent and whatever is, is safe in the minds of our public works director. My only comment is that uh, I would suggest to be prudent and uh, conservative in how many signs you put up. I, I mentioned before when we put our bike path on Birch, 
we have these 10 foot long, I think, and three foot wide thermoplastic signs plastered on the street. There's like 30 of them just between ash and birch, and it's a dead end. It does get to the Santa Marca Trail. Uh, so I, I would suggest that because of cost, I remember years ago we got a lot of complaints on the bay side of town about the amount of signage that was distractive to the drivers on the bay side of town. We went out and surveyed, we found like 95% of them were signs that the town had put up. So we ended up taking our own signs down. But whatever is prudent, whatever is safe, I would certainly suggest. One thing I would also consider is, I don't know who's responsible now for maintenance, the Santa Marca Trail, but I think, as I told my English daughter-in-law, we have a number of people that don't know that we drive on the right-hand side here. And I know it says on the path that we're supposed to stay to the right, but I've noticed pedestrians and bicyclists, particularly from the entrance at Apache all the way down to, to uh, Tamil Vista, that uh, there's a lack of understanding the state of the right. There are a couple of, of striped uh, signs that are sort of mention that, but that might be something that we should revisit when we look at the signage for, for stripe. And sorry for the derive there. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else from the public wish to comment? Okay, then we'll bring it back to the council for comments. Kirby, you look like you're ready with something there. Go ahead. Yeah, so I guess I wasn't at this meeting. Maybe I was, maybe I wasn't at this meeting when we picked these locations, but I've thought about this for a while. And um, there's a lot of state laws. Um, there's a, I see this as like a, almost a public service, right? Um, we want to inform the people about state laws. Um, I think we put banners, you know, around about things happening in town. This could be one of them. Um, if we're going to start posting signs throughout town about state laws, we're informing the general population about laws, generally for the state of California. Is this the one? Like, no texting while driving, I would say, is more important than this one. Right? The most broken law in, in Marin, sorry, I'm kind of passionate about this. The most broken law in Marin is probably teenage drivers driving with other teenagers in the car the first year they drive. Like, let's put a sign and make that out there. There's a lot of other laws. Murder is illegal in California. Like, there's a lot of other laws. Is, is this the one we're going to pick to plaster up on the streets. Any other comments? If I may answer that, um, <clears throat> I have kind of a personal bias. I get because that. Because <laughs> a year ago, the guy that hit me was violating this law, and there are no signs on White's Hill. So mm -hmm. I, think, I don't think we're talking about putting a lot of signs up. I think we're talking about putting up a few and what I think are some key bike routes you know, where we have a lot of bike traffic. And I think you, and again, I mean, I have a huge personal bias now, but I get it. You cannot remind somebody strong enough to give at least three feet. Um, you know, and I spent a month in the hospital because somebody didn't do that. So if um, I'm, I'm kind of all for this and, you know, I think the locations actually are very good. I mean, those are exactly the ones I would, because I think those are the main ones used by, you know, lots of road bike riders, and those are the ones where you get. So, sorry to differ with you on that, but no. I, I have a slightly. But anybody else wish to provide input or? I think it's a good rule that more people probably need to know about. I don't ride my road bike much anymore because of partially that. Yeah. Mountain bike. Mm. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, I guess you have some direction. <laughs> and you can yeah, I, I, I have some direction. Let me just um, conflicting direction. But. No, that's fine. Um, let me just mention one thing. There was a question about single file, and 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 you know, is that oh, yeah, is that a law? Question. And thank you for remembering um, that. that th actually, the way the vehicle code is written, it says that cyclists are to ride as far to the right as is practicable, and and there's a judgment uh, in, intently written into that part of the vehicle code. Um, it does not say that you have to ride single file. I think there is an exception for a couple of the national parks. In national recreation areas where they have single file uh, rules, I think one of those is, is point raise. Um, so, so yeah, that wouldn't be something that I think, uh, you know, as I, I would tend to lean with Chiravazio on this, having been hit by a car six times in the last 22 years or 25 years. Um, uh, it's not fun, and uh, a lot of times it's this side sideswipe thing. And I think when this uh, law got passed, the idea was it was to be uh, for safety. So um, 
uh, I would look at maybe starting with one or two locations um, just to kind of see how they're received uh, and, and see if they help. And, you know, it would be helpful. I think San Clemente would be a great spot, um, as well as maybe Corte Madera Ave. Um, th those, to me, would be uh, primary locations where we have pretty fast-moving cars passing people fairly closely in our jurisdiction. Um, some of these other locations, Paradise uh, in particular, we're, we're, we're looking at a bike lane project out there soon enough um, that would give lots of width. Um, so again, I wouldn't want to put up a sign that would need to be maintained in a place where it might not be valuable in a, in a short period of time. So um, okay. that's all I have on that. Thank you. Anything else for Peter on that? No. Okay. Uh, progress with steps, lanes, and path maintenance. Okay, um, this was also an item that um, your uh, BPAC committee asked us to kind of look into and, and keep you appraised of. Uh, and so what I might do, since uh, maybe I have the ability to do this, uh, let's see, let's, I, we came up with some of the top five, um, and I got some input from some other people on what they might be. Uh, let's see. Have you all heard of Tainter? Yeah. Okay. Um, what what about <laughs> um, Hill Path? Yes. Is that a top five type of a path? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, how about uh, I have one from Councilmember Coonhart. He suggested Spring Trail. That's the top of Hill Path, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's the spring, yeah. yeah. Um, how about Gene Bean? That's more used than Spring Trail is. Yeah, OK. Definitely. Others that come to mind? Should I keep going to my list? My, uh, how about Ridge Way or California Lane? Do not know those. Well, I think uh, we definitely have uh, a good candidate list here. And what we wanted to do, because we have probably three to four major and, and 10 to 12 minor uh, steps, lanes, and paths, it, would, it was helpful for us to kind of have an idea of what we would hone in on um, for our initial work. Um, so we have met with uh, Lori Rice. Many of you know her. Uh, and we've done a few things for her. We've helped with uh, the geographic information systems, uh, building uh, maps so that the uh, neighborhood resource groups are uh, well informed of, of what the resources they have. And we need to still work on that for the steps, lanes, and paths. Uh, so we've been kind of beginning to look at the easements for those. Uh, there's a lot of legal issues there. Uh, I know we talked about it once. But in terms of like near-term actions, uh, what would be helpful for us is to um, use our, our current resources and programs for brush clearing. I think now is a, a good time to do that. Really um, spend the next month or two uh, on these particular uh, pathways and making sure they're clear. Uh, and then to the point uh, earlier about signage, I think uh, what, what we tried to say was that uh, these type of signs, Tainer, Hill Path, directional signage that helps you find the path, that, that certainly is fine and puts us at no legal uh, uh, peril. It, the problem is when we put arrows, like evacuation this way, um, what we found in California in the last couple of years is that the fires, depending on the wind, are coming from any direction. And one day they'll change. You know, the fires will be fighting uh, on one side, and the winds will change, and the whole front will go to the other side. We have the capacity here in Corte Madera to get fires that could come up the hill, down the hill, from the south, from the north. Uh, and that'll definitely change uh, when and how we direct people to evacuate. So we won't be putting uh, any arrows on there because you can't rely. In a panicked moment, you run out and it says evacuation and it points, you don't know what you're running into. Um, so we're going to allow the public information that comes out when we evacuate neighborhoods to tell people where to go, not, not necessarily the arrows. Um, but uh, more importantly, these uh, five or six are good targets for us, and I'm happy to get any of your questions answered, any uh, suggestions you have as to how we can um, you know, maintain these. Again, the first step is just simply clearing, cleaning, assessing. Uh, we, and then what we hope to do this summer is really get a handle on what the uh, uh, physical improvements are needed. You know, some of these uh, 
paths and steps and trails will need to be rebuilt completely. Um, and so really when we look at the top five and it, it helps us kind of hone in on, on developing an understanding of what fixes are needed. Some will be major, some will be minor, and then we can start putting cost to those. Um, and the last thing I'll say about it is this has dual purpose, right? It's, uh, it's a community amenity. It, it's great for quality of life. So I would call it a, a quality of life purpose that's really nice. But the, the other purpose really is, is uh, you know, safe routes and evacuation. Uh, a tree could go down on one of the narrow streets anywhere in our neighborhood, and you couldn't be able to drive out one particular direction. People may need to evacuate evacuate on foot um, so so it's important for us to have this resource available thank you questions for Peter yes so you said you we can't do a sign that says evacuation route because in fact the fire may be coming from that direction but can there be a sign indicating that there's a path here absolutely yes that's what we want to do. Signs and names, and and yeah, here is the path, and then maybe even a little uh, sign that say you where you know shows a map. Here's where you are. Here's where you could go using different paths. That's fine. What we can't do is say there's an emergency. Go that way. So okay, yeah. that's good. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I had one on. Um, I'm assuming as part of the rehab on some of these, Tainer in particular, I know has an issue with. Um, trees from the neighbors who live right next to it and the tree roots are clearly moving the steps in a way they weren't meant to be moved so I would assume that would be part of the process of maintenance and rehab to yeah it will be um, some trees uh, will almost certainly need to come down uh, in order to rebuild these uh, a lot of these steps and paths so um, you know that'll be a discussion that we'll have with adjacent property owners when we get to that point uh, it's always a you know a trade-off. You know what what amenity do you like? I mean, if it's a big shade tree and you rely on it for cooling all summer. I mean that that can be a, a, a conversation <laughs> for sure to figure out. So, thank you. Any other questions from the BPAC? Okay. Any uh, questions or comments from the public? That's okay. Let's come on up. If you can give your name again. You're Anita Bach. Um, I just wanted Peter to know that we um, did quite an extensive evaluation of the SLPs on Christmas Tree Hill, the NRG. Uh, we walked them all, we took photos of them all, and I will send that to you so that you can see um, some, of course, these names that you've mentioned that are on Christmas Tree Hill are on that uh, list. Surprisingly, there are some 30 SLPs on Christmas Tree Hill, but the photos will give you a good idea of their condition, their size, you know, uh, and uh, there's this brief description on how frequently they're used so that might help you with assessing yeah. what's the priority that'd be great in fact I would even suggest we we sit down your your NRG on Christmas Tree Hill along with Jared and I and any other um, if there's an interested member of the BPAC that wants to sit in because I'd love to know uh, w what you've done and what you've discovered and I think that you know that's part of the other thing that you'll see um, initiate volunteer committee so that for me would be a great place to start uh, talking about who wants to volunteer who wants to help us you know prioritize assess that type of stuff but we do want it to be I know one of the lessons we learned from Mill Valley is they have the, the community was very involved and it really helped guide and, and develop ownership of the of the restoration program so we're looking to emulate that um, so yeah well let's please be in touch yeah anyone else from the public want to speak about this no, hearing none, I'll bring it back to the council for questions, comments. Yes, Cheryl. Um, just to uh, throw out an idea, um, to educate people about where these paths are, some kind of community event, like a treasure hunt for the kids, and they have to find something on this path, and then they have to find something on that path. And, you know, it would get families involved and um, get people out of their homes and see you know what's around them and where they live and I think it would it could be a really fun thing could be a fundraiser even I don't know but um, you know it, I think that could be really fun right thank <laughs> you I'd be up for it uh, I guess an educational <laughs> thank you anybody else I was just add um, I guess you're gonna work with the neighborhoods closely to figure this out okay because the spring trail just having it that high on the priority list for me, I mean, I do walk up there quite a bit, and it is, Spring Trail starts at Summit and Redwood, so it's really high up, and while it may not have, you know, it might need work, it's just, I don't think it's nearly as heavily used as some of these other ones, and I think the priority should be on what's gonna be used and, you know, where the population is. Understood. I run Spring Trail quite a bit. 
Oh, okay. So I'm going to counteract <laughs> that. Um, <laughs> Spring Trail is pretty busted up, and um, and it's pretty steep, and and having sure footing when you're that stage of the climb in the mountain, yeah. be nice to have some stable steps. The stairmaster. Okay, thank you. Uh, sidewalk program, Peter. Okay, uh, well, let's get back to, out of uh, what what mode am I in here? I'm in uh, a mode that. Okay, um, the sidewalk program, I, I, we, we also uh, had a brief discussion about this uh, in 2018, and, and that discussion, I'll remind you, uh, revolved around Santa Fe's program as a model. So Santa Fe has a program where they partner with residents in order to help facilitate sidewalk repairs. Uh, as you all are probably aware, the municipal code dictates that the property owner uh, adjacent the sidewalk in front of your property is your responsibility to maintain at all times. So um, there's some specific triggers that cause sometimes the public work staff to uh, remind uh, a property owner what the municipal code says and ask them uh, or give them 30 to 60 days to make a repair. Um, those typically have to do with when you do home improvements and you're seeking other permits and you get some inspection out there. Uh, if someone trips in front of your house and makes a complaint, that often uh, gets us active, uh, the property owner and the town notifying the property owner. Uh, but ultimately, what we want to do is, um, you know, come up with a, a comprehensive way to improve the walking environment in town. Uh, and I would say that um, the, the, the way that we're probably going to do this the most is this all roads in 2019. And of course, every year thereafter, um, uh, will be uh, paved. And as part of that paving program, uh, we are going after the sidewalks um, in that area. And I think uh, Mr. Uh, <clears throat> Robinson probably witnessed that on Ash, a lot of the sidewalk improvements, uh, you know, were done uh, along with the paving program. So um, we've, we've hired Precision Concrete, which does this type of work. Uh, they, they survey, they develop recommendations for the, for the town, and they also do this kind of shaving work. So they'll come out and, you know, smooth an area and at a low cost, um, to try to remove some of the some of the trip hazards, uh, and we did we have implemented with uh, recent paving projects some of this 50/50 uh, match, uh, where the town will pay for half of the improvements, um, and then what we're doing with this survey with precision concrete is we're looking at uh, our barrier removal implementation plan that was we affectionately call the BRIP, uh, and we're really trying to capture how many locations, what the costs are, um, and and put that into a sidewalk program um, that we can work with the community and the property owners to implement. So um, I just wanted the, the BPAC committee to know that we're moving this forward. Uh, and I think probably the next thing you'll hear from it uh, from us is what the results of the Precision Concrete Survey is uh, and what recommendations they make uh, for us in terms of implementing a program uh, like the one in Santa Fe uh, or, or other ways to go about removing uh, these uh, barriers, as we call them. Thank you. Any questions from council? Okay. Open it to the public. Jim, you've been talking about this for years, right? <laughs> Almost as long as the whole <laughs> crosswalk. Uh, Again, Jim Robinson, and I thank you, Peter Brown, for uh, getting us to where we are today on this program. I guess I had one comment. Uh, uh, well, first one question. Uh, I assume that if someone still contacts the town of Corte Madera and says, you know, Citizen XYZ has a hazardous sidewalk, uh, that uh, the town will respond to that Other, in addition to those that are involved in the paving projects. And we do, uh, as Mr. Brown mentioned, I do appreciate the work that was done on um, on ash recently to, to correct some of those uh, i think it's a good program i think it uh, be a great benefit i hope that more people will take care of it the town tried this 15 years ago and uh, nobody took advantage of the funds that were available at the 50 percent level then and i'm sure that as i know concrete prices are are much more expensive now than than then but uh, uh, i would also 
we talk about a lot of things at this committee, but I keep beating on this survey that was done by the uh, senior citizens on behalf of senior citizens years ago, and they talked about a number of priorities. What are the priorities of senior citizens? And since I am one now, uh, I, I did participate in that survey, and the, the number one need identified by the seniors of all others in the town of Corp Madera was safe sidewalks. So I think that this will go a long way to uh, uh, to deal with that issue and also protect our residents too if they have a hazardous sidewalk. No one wants to have a claim file against them as a result of someone tripping and falling in front of their sidewalk, in front of their house as we live in this litigious society we're in now. But thanks again to Mr. Brown and the commission for bringing this forward and uh, appreciate the work you've done. Thank you. Anybody else want to talk about this? Okay, we'll bring it back to the BPAC for comments or questions for staff. Okay, hearing none, then we will move on to approval of the minutes from the December 13th meeting. <coughs> Are there any changes or additions to the minutes? Not, I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes. Motion to approve. Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say aye. Okay. And our next meeting, June 20th, Peter? Yeah, yeah if um, you recall, we, we've moved to a bi-monthly uh, meeting program. I think we missed a couple meetings earlier, uh, certainly the February meeting. But on the BPAC uh, website is all the dates for the rest of the year. June 20th is the next meeting. Um, we're sticking to the third Thursday. Um, so, so yeah, if you have any ideas or thoughts and uh, issues you'd like uh, on the agenda, typically what we do at the staff level is we look at uh, you know where we're at what projects we think need updating uh, and then you know we, we contact the chair and we talk about potential um, you know items so either contact the chair or contact me if you have items you want uh, potentially considered for June or any of the BPAC members we, we have a website the town Oh, yeah. the town website. The town, town BPAC website. Well, the town website has a BPAC page, and that's the BPAC website. All right. Thank you. You want your picture on it? Or? No, I'm good. <laughs> uh, okay, then thank you. And I'm so sorry about setting the alarm off at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, <laughs> and we started late, but thank you all for attending, and uh, we will adjourn the meeting. Thank you so much for yeah. attending. Thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate it.